Hello, and welcome to this first episode of Let's Talk Death. I'm Kiri Meyer. And I'm Andy McNeil. And we are thrilled to be your host for these conversations. So Let's Talk Death is brought to you by Heal Grief. Uh, it's a social support network uh, creating community after a loved one has died. Uh, everything we do is inspired by our core belief. That is that no one should ever grieve alone. Our goal with this program is to have a friendly chat with some of the grief field's leading voices. Uh, we wanna be able to help normalize, educate uh, our heal grief community. So we're pleased to kick off this new show with Dr. Robert Niemeyer. Dr. Robert Niemeyer has published 30 books, including Techniques of Grief Therapy, and serves as an editor of Death Studies. He is a researcher, author, professor, and therapist, just a friend to so many in this field. Um, just delighted to have him with us here today. Uh, he's currently working to advance a more adequate theory of grieving as a meaning-making process. So welcome, Dr. Niemeyer. We are so glad to have you here with us today. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, thank you for inviting me to the party. Of course, we are, are excited to talk to you about all of the work that you do. And we're wondering first, if we can kind of have a little bit of an introduction, if you can tell us about how you first got involved in bereavement work. Oh, well, that's the deep question, isn't it? Uh, each of us would probably answer this if we do so in an honest way, also in a very personal and vulnerable way. Um, because few of us get into this work just because it's an academic or professional interest, right? We're usually moved by our own life losses uh, to be sensitized to the role of hard life transitions and having to struggle when someone close to our heart uh, dies and is no longer physically part of our life. Then we're reminded of the universal condition of loss, um, which reaches into our lives equally with that of our clients. This is certainly true for me. Um, my father died by suicide when I was just about 10 days shy of my 12th birthday. So at age 11, um, my world was changed in one moment uh, when my panicked mother came running into the bedroom that I shared with my little brother and basically screaming in a kind of you know, very anxious voice, uh, boy's voice, I can't wake up your father. And as we staggered in our little footed pajamas on a cold Ohio uh, winter morning to the threshold of their bedroom and looked in, we, you know, we saw her vain attempt to awaken him. Uh, she kind of fell over from the side to his back lifelessly. And the, the scream that she emitted at that point effectively ended our childhood and launched us into a, a very difficult stretch uh, for the next uh, decade or more. And in some ways for my mother, I think, for the rest of her life. So, of course, that's not the only loss in my life. There have been many of uh, best friends and uh, dear acquaintances, and many extended family members, uh, parents, my own and my wife's. Um, uh, I have not lost a child, mercifully, at least to this point, but of course I've worked alongside hundreds of others who have. And so across these great range of losses, I am reminded of the importance of, of loss in my life and that of others. And it's that, I think, that really alerted me to this work uh, as I consciously began to give it attention then in my college and graduate years and beyond into my career as a psychologist. So, so let's talk about that for a second. Um, in addition to your personal experience that you had in your life, and as you put it, that brings many of us into this type of work, you conducted so many studies, written extensively, you've worked with thousands of individuals. Um, I wonder if in, in that, um, what, what have you discovered over the years, just doing that meaning-making work and why it's so important for the individuals. Well, I, I think, Andy, that you really put your, your finger on the, the button with that. I think that that's a, a really key theme for me is that I recognize that when we lose someone who is really central to our life, especially when that death is, you know, off time, it comes too early, 
or in some cases too late, like after a long period of debilitation or dementia. Um, when we experience those losses, especially traumatically, suddenly, sometimes violently, or in ways that involve complicated human intention, like perhaps through overdose or suicide or homicide or medical malpractice, in all of these ways, we not only experience an assault on our close bonds with others that we really rely on to get through life, but we also experience a kind of tearing apart of a world of meaning anchored in those relationships. And if you were to ask me the question, what do I mean by meaning? I guess I mean a lot of things. I mean, um, at, a, at a very practical level, um, what matters to us throughout the day? What matters to us in our lives? What are our life purposes? When they've been woven together with a, a you know, an intimate other, you know, a soulmate, a family member, um, right? Maybe we are linked to the other with bonds of expectation as with a young child or even a, a child we're carrying inside us that dies uh, a perinatal death. In, in all of these cases, our life story gets woven together with that of other people, right? In memory, in current actuality, and in hope for a shared future. And when that person is torn away from us, the fabric of our life story is also torn apart. And what matters to us and who matters to us often comes under review. We have to ask the question, you know, sometimes for the first time, who am I now, now that I'm no longer a parent or no longer this person's spouse or no longer have this parent or sibling or intimate other in my life? You know, my life is reduced. My sense of myself is reduced. Who am I now? And we have to ask as well the question, whose am I now, right? Who do I belong to? And, you know, who is my secure base, the person who's going to be the refuge I go to when the seas of life get stormy? What harbor do I pull up into now? And, and if I've been that kind of caregiving figure to another, particularly a child or an elderly parent, what happens when I lose that caregiving part of my life? So in all of these ways, I view grieving as, in a very deeply emotional way, rewriting our life stories that are changed and challenged by loss. And that can hold at levels right on up to very abstract existential concerns. Uh, oftentimes when we face an unjust or violent death in the family, for example, it calls into question our basic life philosophy or world assumptions or our spiritual views, right? Where was God when my child was dying? Or what kind of universe is it that could allow a random accident like this to take the life of someone close to me. Um, so all of those are the kinds of considerations that often are not simply solved by a well-conducted funeral or by general social support. They sometimes require very deep reflection and, and sometimes personal work with others who know the territory. Do you feel it's best done Independent, do independent work or, or in groups or, or is there a combination of those things? Or how? Well, I, I'm kind of with you and, and with the site uh, that you are representing and saying that I also hold the idea that um, we should never grieve alone, right? Except when we have to, um, <laughs> that, right? right? There are ways in which our loss is uniquely ours, even when we have a loss of a family member, then other surviving family members have had the same loss, but not necessarily the same grief. And so we have to acknowledge what is radically individual. Sometimes, whether it's in for a religiously inclined person at a prayerful moment or a meditative moment, or for any of us, whether we're secular or spiritual, maybe practices of journaling and contemplation of our lives now, um, occasionally, seeking out the support of a, a professional, a counselor, a therapist, especially when those losses have an element of, of trauma and complication in them. Um, 
there can be roles for others at all of these levels, including at the level of mutual support of others who have had kind of parallel losses in their own lives and can maybe stand into our reality a little more fully. So quick question for you. Do you feel that this works for all age groups or do you feel you hit a certain point? Because this is, this is very deep and meaningful. Do you think it can be done with different developmental levels? Oh yeah. I think as human beings, we are condemned to meaning from the earliest forms of pattern recognition that an infant at the age of N the basic neurology of our brains orients us toward um, identifying patterns, looking at stable regularities, how things happen. Um, we attempt to put together causal sequences, understanding what follows what and why. Um, we deal with a whole attempt across the course of our development to understand the world and understand ourselves and to understand the world of others, that is, their views and feelings, as well as our own. So this is not an adult kind of preoccupation. It doesn't require a postgraduate degree. It isn't something that's engaged only by people who have IQs of 150 or above. This is fundamental um, to our humanity. Um, we are storytelling beings. We are not only homo sapiens, knowing beings, we are homo nerans. We live our lives in narratives, in stories. And when the story of our life seems to go so profoundly wrong and critical players in that story are torn out of our lives, we have to rewrite every future chapter going forward because we don't have their physical presence with us, however much we might carry them with us in our, the realm of emotion and shared um, recollection. Um, their physical absence requires a revision of our stories. So this is true whether you have a child in play therapy acting out with figurines and a sand tray world, a particular loss and its consequences, or whether you're sitting down having a conversation in therapy or in a support group with someone else about what they've gone through. It's that hearing, hearing you describe it in that way, it, it gives that picture of sort of the continual process in our yeah. lives, of processing and reprocessing. I, I like really the way you phrase that. Moment. It's not really one moment. That, that's right. And, you know, if we go back to my father's death, the sense that I made of that at age 12, of course, was evolving profoundly by the time I had 16, 18, and then I'm starting to read all of these philosophers and, and spiritual traditions and so on all through uh, my early adulthood. And, and it evolves still further when, uh, you know, at age 35, I give birth to my own child and I am a father now um, after not having had one for the majority of my life. Um, and when I reached the age at which my father died and lived beyond that, still further reflections and conversations ensued. So I do think that from the earliest moments of our loss, we are engaged in trying to process and reprocess the story. Fortunately, we do so across time with the resources that we develop um, as we mature and maybe grow a little more wiser and a little more perspective uh, is available to us. Um, but also by dint of the social resources we have, we, you know, we no longer have to rely on maybe that same decimated family that was struggling with the same loss that we were in the early months or years. Now we can do so, you know, at a later point, surrounded by the, the friends and companions who can, um, you know, sort of stand with us in, in making sense of what does this mean to you now, Bob? So we have a, just, oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to say, so one thing we say uh, uh, quite often is that we don't believe grief ever just goes away or you just move on from it, but it's a journey. So I feel like with 
everything that you're saying about meaning making, this is actually a, a healthy thing to say it's a journey because we keep processing, but at different levels and different times in our lives. Sure, absolutely. I, I love that idea. And I, I certainly would subscribe to that. Um, yeah, it does evolve as we do. Um, and, you know, grieving begins with who we are and extends to what we do. It's, uh, it's shaped by each individual, our own personality, our own resources, our own kind of strengths. Um, and it also can touch on our own vulnerability, our sense of abandonment, um, our sense of, uh, of real questioning um, when the loss is tragic. And maybe what come to, comes under uh, review is our sense of control or our ability to protect others we love from bad things. Um, so we often have to take another look at um, the basic assumptions by which we put together our worlds and make adjustments uh, in those to accommodate hard realities. Mm -hmm. But we can grow a great deal from this, of course. This is the good news of grief is that um, post-loss growth is a reality and it's displayed by very many across time who deepen their compassion for the suffering of others, who come to be more tolerant of themselves, wiser about what matters in the long term, um, more self-aware regarding the significance of their own emotions and needs and that of others, um, and sometimes more alive in their spiritual lives or deeper in their, in their philosophies. Um, I think there are, there are many good outcomes to grief right alongside the tragic ones. So in a lot of ways, even it's not just you wouldn't, we wouldn't necessarily characterize it as just a loss. It's really a human narrative. It's really the what it it's really that, that narrative that is part of just being human, and that we're all you know, subject to loss to the, these things. Absolutely, that yeah. I mean, it. I think we can say that um, in some sense, as human beings, we are wired for attachment in a world of impermanence, right? We are put together in a way that connects us to others, but we live in a world in which those connections, at least in a physical sense, are always temporary. And if only at the point of our own death or that of the other, there will be a kind of uh, challenge to that bond and the need to rework it in a form that is sustainable now. Um, the person may not sit down to breakfast with us or to go to bed with us at night. Um, but we can maintain the connection, um, the love, the memory. We can continue to circulate their stories and take inspiration from their lives. And there are these non-physical ways in which we do, in a way, revise rather than relinquish our ties of love. So we only have a few minutes left. Uh, this has been a great time together. It's just so short and quick, but with our few minutes left, I wonder um, if someone's watching this who's grieving, listening to this, watching this, this conversation, what, and, and they want to know more. They want to know more about meaning making. They want to learn a little bit more about that process. How do they introduce that into their life? What, what advice would you give them just to kind of, where do they start? What, what advice do you have? Well, yeah, I could point to some resources. Certainly your website would be one such, right? The Healing Grief site is a wonderful portal into a world of support. Um, probably because they're watching this on the website, they're, they're quite familiar with it. Um, another that's interesting to look at from a standpoint of meaning making is a site called LifeSpark Weekly. LifeSpark Weekly all one word. And that's actually put together by a, a colleague of mine, uh, Jason Holland. Um, he focuses not only on meaning as it applies to death, but meaning as it applies to life. And it's a very uh, snappy, engaging, interactive site that I think people might find uh, quite intriguing if they're trying to review and revise and revision their own life purposes and meanings. Um, also, um, working on a book now that will be coming out. Maybe I can talk to you when yes. it was yes, uh, called Living Beyond Loss, Questions and Answers About Grief and Bereavement. And 
especially for any professionals who might be listening in, um, I might mention that I also direct a kind of university without walls for training in grief therapy called the Portland Institute. So P-O-R-T-L-A-N-D, Portland, as in Portland, Oregon, Institute, portlandinstitute.org. Um, and that provides a kind of certification program in grief therapy as a meaning-making enterprise. So if anyone uh, is engaged in support services, whether they are professionals or if they are bereavement volunteers or um, bereavement services coordinators and so on, they might be interested in checking out that site. Um, there are many good resources and many of them are accessible via the web. Sometimes though there is still a role for that face-to-face -face experience, whether it's in terms of training or therapy, um, when we recognize that at the end of the day, there is no substitute for a, a real human hug given in a support group, for example. All right. Well, Dr. Oh. Niemeyer, we want to thank you once again for being our first guest and helping us kick off Let's Talk Death. Um, we, we are just so grateful to have you. So thank you for all of your information and for chatting with us today. Well, thank you for your energy, your organization, and for your sharing this mission to, to make death more speakable and to make grief something that people don't have to do alone. I salute you both. Thank you. You. And so if people wanted to get, they want to be able to get more information from you, would it be the Portland website or would there be another way that they would access? I, I, yeah, I think the portlandinstitute.org would be one. If people are interested in some of the writing around this area, especially professional writing, they might also look at my individual website, which is robertneemeyerphd.com. And I can provide both of those links for you if you'd like to conveniently post them for the uh, viewers. That would be that would be wonderful. So thank you, thank you, Dr. Niemeyer. We appreciate you. It's a pleasure. So for our those who have, are listening to this webcast, um, if you uh, would like to learn more about Heal Grief, uh, please visit us at healgrief.org. And Let's Talk Death episodes will air monthly, so make sure to sign up on healgrief.org to receive our monthly link for our new episode. And thank you for joining us. I'm Andy McNeil. And I'm Kiri Meyer. And we will see you next time on Let's Talk Death. You guys are great. <laughs>